Thank you, Oscar, so very much. And again, good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. James Presbyterian Church here on the corner of 145th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue in the village of Harlem in the city of New York. And we are grateful that you are here for us for our final official Black History Month Sunday. Last Sunday in Black History Month, it's officially Black History Month ends this week. But we know that Black history and all history is celebrated all throughout the year. So we invite you to rest, relax, and bring yourselves to worship today as we focus in on faith. I wasn't able to tell our people on Facebook, I apologize again that we had a little commercial that we usually do to let people know what's going on, but you're with us now. We hope and pray. Now let us be still and hear our opening psalm of the day. We had a great study on Monday with our opening psalm, because our opening psalm, I want you to remember during this period of Lent, which is leading up to Good Friday and to Easter, you will hear these familiar strains of the first verses of this psalm on Easter, on Good Friday, where Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But we very rarely, rarely read the section we're going to read today, which is Psalm 22, verses 22 through 31. Just imagine Jesus trying to figure out a way to find some comfort and he goes to the scriptures of the Psalms on the cross and this is how it ends. After this first, after we hear that and think about that first verse, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He goes to this and says, I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. And in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. And you offspring, all offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. And those who seek his name shall praise the Lord and may your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow down all who go down in the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. This is our Psalm reading of the day. I now introduce you to our liturgist who is online with us today, ruling elder Andrea Bradford. We welcome you to our worship this morning as well. Thank you, thank you, and good morning, everyone. I am blessed to be here with you. So thank you for that welcome. I am in the beautiful city of Huntsville, Alabama, where the temperatures are in the 60s. And next week, they're going to be in the 70s. And it's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful day in Alabama. So I send some of that warmth your way. And we also send some of that warmth for our communal worship together this morning. It is indeed a blessing. So let us continue our worship with our call to worship. We lift every voice and come to bring praises. God is faithful and has journeyed with us through the ages. We come to pray every prayer, leaving our burdens at the altar of grace. God has been faithful and guides us through life's maze to great moments of glory. We come to make firm our resolve to be the love of Christ to help heal the world. God has been faithful 
the promise of Abraham, an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And ain't of that good news. Our opening um, hymn this morning is Great is Thy Faithfulness, which the lyrics are in your bulletin. It can also be found in 276 in the blue hymnal. So let us sing this great hymn of the church. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have been in thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, they join with all nature in a manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy. are blessed because God is faithful mm. and we pray and we thank God for that faithfulness this is our prayer of adoration at the time some may have asked isn't Abraham too old to father a nation mm. Isn't Sarah past her time to have a child? You, O oh God, showed us that nothing is impossible for you. Sojourner Truth asked the question, ain't I a woman? Hmm. Huh. And you showed how to use your power to use whose who society counts for naught. Hmm. 
Bayed Rustin was black and gay, and you called him as architect for the march on Washington against all odds. We give you thanks that send your love pulsing mm. through every fiber of our being. <laughs> and in that silence, we hear you whisper in our hearts, I am your God yes. and you are my people. May we always remember and never forget. Amen. Amen. This special Black History Month, we've been asking if anybody wanted to do anything for the service. And Amen said, I think I want to do something. And as he stretches from his nap after his morning snack, he's going to bring us a gift today. How could anyone? Take your time. The musical strings are beautiful, and we'll get you up here, and you're going to put on his jacket, and he's going to be all ready to sing you this beautiful song to let us know that God sees us as beautiful. So don't let nobody else tell you otherwise. Amen. Amen, so very much. It's so beautiful to hear a child's voice in song. There's something, something innocent, but focused in a way that I don't think they even understand at this point. Mm -hmm. But thank you, Amen. Yeah. I know you can't you can't see me, but I thank you for your blessing this morning. Keep singing. Yeah. And he you, did that, he even did that when he wasn't quite feeling well. So we know. We that's all feeling. right. That well, as they used to tell me, never tell people you're not feeling well. Just go yeah. on and do it. <laughs> And do your best, and you did, and it was beautiful. Yes. And I hope you remember through your life just what you said to us this morning. Amen. So we move on with our prayers, with that 
with that youthful feeling that Eamon has just given us, which is such a blessing. We continue to move on. We as adults, we as people of God, and sometimes we have to say that we're sorry for some of the things that we do or don't do. And so we have this time to come together in that confession. This is our call. In our confession, mm -hmm. we don't admit our sinful nature to God to shame ourselves and others. Oh. We pray this prayer to face our humanity and move a little closer to righteousness. Mm. So here is our prayer <clears throat> together. We, we read the headlines and are discouraged by the raging wars and can't seem to choose a side. Help us to choose the side of peace. We walk the aisles of grocery stores, counting pennies as prices rise. Help us to remember it is cheaper to share than to go it alone. Yes, we find ourselves discouraged moving throughout this world, wondering where you are. And still, here we are, hoping our love for you will help see us through. How? We do not know, yet you will. Of this we are sure. Let us have a moment of silent confession here in the silence of New York City this morning for just a few moments where we may be able to lift up our own personal prayers of confession. Get to the checkout line at the grocer and realize you have just enough <laughs> when you are facing an empty plate and you realize that your neighbor said come on over i got some extra meatloaf <laughs> god always provides and these are just little things that god has done for us that allows us to profess our love for god and say well i really I really love the Lord. Let's just sing these few verses. It goes like this. Yes, I really love the Lord. I really love the Lord. You don't know what he's done for me.
And God really loves us. And <laughs> there you go. And so we have this love in forgiveness. This love that we can now acknowledge as God's forgiveness for us just because. This assurance of pardon says not knowing how and yet being sure. Ah, so this is the mysterious faithfulness for which we yearn. Amen. Holy One, your mercy and grace are revealed in this embrace of mystery. Mercy and grace, the seeds and soil of faith. May the love of Christ rain down and make it grow. Juliana Andrea Bradford, I'm going to ask you to read that again because we just gave a definition for faith and we just gave yeah. a definition for how God works with our faith, with mercy and grace and seeds and all that. So read that again to let it sink into our consciousness. We heard it through our brains and our ears, but let it sink into our hearts. Yes, yes. Remembering that this is the assurance of forgiveness and encouragement for that faith. It says not knowing how and yet being sure. Ah, <laughs> so this is the mysterious faithfulness for which we yearn. Holy One, your mercy and grace are revealed in this embrace of mystery. Mercy and grace, the seeds and soil of faith. <laughs> May the love of Christ rain down and make it grow. Amen. Amen. And we have a traditional spiritual here. Sister Pearl is sitting back in Greater New Jerusalem Institutional Baptist Church. I will trust in the Lord till I die. Sometimes she'd come to church in her maid's uniform, sometimes her usher uniform, but she would lift her head and sing, I will trust. In the Lord I will trust, in the Lord I will trust, in the Lord until I Right, I'm gonna treat everybody right. I'm gonna treat everybody right until I die. I'm gonna treat everybody right. I'm gonna treat everybody right. I'm gonna treat. Till I die, so I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord until I die. I will trust.
Amen, 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 amen. Pearl. Pearl. And the trick about that is she'd often sing that through testimony service where she would be tired from the night before and she would literally have her head hang down and just say, I will trust. And it gave her the energy and the spirit to continue on in the service. And next thing you know, by, by one o'clock, she was jumping up and dancing in the aisles. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. James Presbyterian Church here on the corner of 141st Street and St. Nicholas Avenue, across from the wonderful park of St. Nicholas Park and the famed Bento's Funeral Home, of course, that sends people to rest in a joyous way. We are grateful to be here in this spot since 1927 in this building that was built in 1904-05, but being a congregation that was founded in 1895, but coming back from our mother congregation, which was founded in 1822. So with that Black History Month, we celebrate that history of this congregation, and not just this congregation, but the ministry that this congregation represents. Still, over 200 years later, a church that was started for abolition, for a place for people to be liberated, we still believe in finding ways where people need to be liberated nowadays, because we've all got something we need to say, make us free. And here is a place where we're gonna help you do that with the love and joy of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I sort of lost my bulletin somewhere, but that's okay, because I know that it's, I'm just gonna, let me just do this till I get our, <laughs> It'll happen next week, Raj. <laughs> I just want to share with you some of the incidences of our community life, and I want to welcome here my, my dear, 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 dear friend, Vicki. Vicki is here with her cousin from Sweden, and I am so grateful that you are here. You all have heard me talk about the Marion Inn and singing with George Mester Hazy several times. George and Vicky were partners and he played piano late night at the, at the Marion Inn and then would come over in the morning to the church and play. <laughs> we remember those times well, don't we, Vicky? <laughs> so it is great. I'm so glad that you are here. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you for being with us as well. Thank you so much. Talk so make it. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> so we are grateful for that. And Vicky also knew my mother very, very, very well. She called her um, pie. She was mom called. She called her like my, my mom was pie and everybody was pie. I was D pie. So and all that stuff. So here is a section dedicated to my mom in the service every week, Vicky. Call from my mom to you. She used to give me these sayings from her from her little worksheet when she was in the nursing home. But then I decided we'd keep it going. So here's one from Marion Wright Edelman. And it simply says, You really can change the world if you care enough. You really can change the world if you care enough. So let's remember that as we move forward. I also want to invite everyone to remember that there is a Lenten prayer break. That's what we've decided to call it. It's not a, it's not a prayer meeting anymore. It's not this. It's a half hour prayer break where we lift up an opportunity or something that we want to bring to the Lord for our Lenten season. And we just pray. And it's only 30 minutes. And it uses the church's website. Um, it's inspired by thinking what it means to actually stop in the middle of your day say a prayer, and then go back. So it's a wonderful opportunity that the half hour really shifts you in a way that um, I used to do that with Lab Shul um, all throughout the pandemic, and it just stuck with me. That's where we, so you can go to this church um, Zoom on, on uh, Tuesdays at 5 p.m. where we have our Lenten prayer break. We also have our Bible studies on Monday evening where I sit in back there with the camera and a light next to the radiator and sort of do our scriptures where we study our scriptures for the coming Sunday. And so you see those scriptures in your bulletin and we are grateful to be doing that as well. 
Brother Anthony wanted to come up and speak for just a moment to say something. So if you could do that now, that would be great. And I'll take a sip of coffee. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, today is a special day for me because I'm honoring my mother. Uh, it's her 114th year birthday. However, my mother died in 1974, but uh, we still, I came from a large family and we still care about her a great deal. And I said, well, I'm going to mention this at service today. So there's two things that she taught us, taught all of us, but I remember in particular was that if you can get through it, adversity will only make you stronger. Well, I was in grade school at the time, so I didn't really understand what she was saying. But I think about it now, many, many years later. And the other thing she said, the only thing that I want, because she had a hard life, is peace and quiet. That's it. No flat screens, no computers, just peace and quiet. But one of the things that I learned going through this stage as I've gotten older is you have the adversity, which I was doing very well with getting through because I was young. But as I got older, the adversity was here and the strength was here. It was reversed. Because I was able to get through the, uh, through the adversity, but I, was, I needed more strength. And I started coming down to St. James. And that was the missing element for me. A uh, pastor has spoken about uh, coming down here for an oil change. I was saying an oil change, a car. He wasn't talking about that kind of oil. He's talking about the oil inside of you, inside of me. So saying that, I want to say happy birthday, Ma. We love you, and I wish you another 114 years. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Now we honor mothers and fathers here. We honor community and we honor the life building blocks that bring us to where we are. And I'm sure that your mother will be proud of all of the arts happenings that are happening with you. Um, he's being done up all over the place, articles written about him, little clips from up in Batavia, and your artwork is coming off, flying off of the map. So we thank you so much for that. And we know that it's because you have been steadfast with your faith and God blesses you when you're steadfast. So you never know how it's gonna happen, but here it is. So blessings, amen and amen. Also, since we have been doing our Black History Month thing and we've had this St. James History Corner, which was suggested by our session members, in your bulletin, you will see that there is a beautiful photo, not a photograph, but a rendering um, a lithograph from the 1800s of a gentleman named Theodore Sedgwick Wright. And remember, we looked at his house last week at 235 West Broadway, which still exists, which was the house in which he hid the enslaved who were freed so that he could bring them into his church, Shiloh Presbyterian Church, our mother church, um, so that they could be either moved further north or so on and so forth. But he was thought to have been born in New Jersey in 1797. And he attended the New African, New York African Free School. And so with the help of even the governor of New York at the time, Governor DeWitt Clinton and Arthur Tappan and others, he enrolled in the Princeton Theological Seminary. Princeton Theological Seminary. And in 1828 became its first black graduate. And this is something I, I rare to put to, rarely put together, but simultaneously, he was the first African-American to graduate from any American college or university. Sure. And after graduation, Wright became the pastor of what they called, what the records called the first colored church, yeah. Presbyterian Church of New York City, but we called Shiloh, where he worked for the rest of his life. The other thing that you don't know about him is in 1833, Wright became one of the founders of the American Anti-Slavery Society. And if you look online, you'll see several of his speeches that he gave talking about the treatment of free blacks as well. 
He served as the executive, the society's executive committee until May 1840, when he joined other abolitionists in forming the American and foreign anti-slavery society. He was major, a major voice. Um, he and um, Cornish were a major voice where people were saying, okay, well now that you're free, why don't we just ship you back to Africa? <laughs> it was like, uh, we have some stuff that we can do here, so we're good. <laughs> but two years ago, three years ago, three years ago, um, Princeton Theological Seminary had a library that was named after some person that who they found out during their history was an enslaver and that he had a horrible reputation when it came to race relations. And so they took his name off and they dedicated the library to Theodore Sedgwick Wright. So if you go to Princeton Theological Seminary now, you'll see that there's the, 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 the Theodore Sedgwick Wright Library. Well, during that time, there was an address that was given by a New Testament professor, an African-American woman, who spoke beautifully, not just about all the accolades, because you know when we talk about history and I talk about the, um, the oral narrative of history, like the narrative history, like what went on behind the scenes. Like we know that Paul Robeson went to Rutgers University and played football and had a hard time getting on the team, but we don't know and don't hear about they pulled out his fingernails and his father made him go back to practice to make sure that he would stand firm and not let anyone discourage him. Those are the types of things that we want to hear that go underneath all of these fabulous, wonderful things. So let's hear a little bit about Theodore Sedgwick Wright. Um, Andrea Bradford is going to read that address for us this morning. And I want you to listen carefully to the words of this professor down in Princeton as she spoke of Theodore Sedgwick Wright. Ruling Elder Andrea Bradford. Yes, yes, thank you. And he was, I might add, a handsome gentleman, too, as you can tell from the photograph. <laughs> this is a speech uh, given, it's called a bio biographical reflection of Theodore Cedric Wright by Professor Lisa Bowens. The speech was presented at the Wright Library Dedication Service on October 13th, 2021. Theodore Cedric Wright, class of 1828, was a giant. He was a well-known abolitionist, preacher, and pastor who was part of a group of leading abolitionists of his day that included people such as Frederick Douglass, Daniel Payne, Samuel Eli Cornish, and David Walker. Frederick Douglass called Wright one of the most intellectual and moral men in the country. And Daniel Payne, the renowned bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, said of Wright that he was, quote, beloved by everyone who knew him on account of his generous nature and Catholic spirit, unquote. As a participant in the Underground Railroad, as one of the founders of the American Anti-Slavery Society, as an agent of America's first black newspaper, Freedom's Journal, and as chair of the New York Vigilance Committee, Wright dedicated his life to the abolition of slavery and to the dismantling of the prejudice that undergirded it. Consequently, he not only fought against the enslavement of African Americans, but also the blatant racism that affected the lives of free African Americans. Wright wrote that, quote, the prejudice which exists is like the atmosphere everywhere felt, unquote. He vehemently opposed the American Colonization Society, a cause that his seminary professors here at Princeton Seminary led and championed. It advocated the colonization of Blacks back to Africa. In opposition to this movement, during a speech at an anti-colonization meeting in New York, Wright stated, for one, I abhor the colonization doctrine, not merely or mainly because I'm a colored American, but chiefly and specially because I am a Christian and a minister, and woe is me if I do not stand by the gospel. 
rights, willingness to speak out, to fight for justice, and to imagine a world where equality exists make him one of the giants in American history. In 1836, during one of his visits back to the seminary after his graduation, Wright was verbally and physically assaulted in the chapel by a white man who believed that because of his race, Wright did not belong here and he had no business being on the grounds of Princeton Seminary. After using a racial, a racist term, the man yelled at Wright, what do you do here? What do you do here? Don't let me see you here again. This event affected Wright deeply, causing him to send a letter about the incident to his former professor here at the seminary, Archibald Alexander. In his letter to Alexander, Wright declares that the man in attempting to degrade him actually degraded himself. Mm -hmm. Despite the horrific nature of the event, Wright remarkably states in the letter to Alexander that he still carried feelings of profound respect and affection for Princeton Seminary, his alma mater, and that, that he felt when at Princeton, he was in the midst of fathers and brethren in the holy and responsible work to which we are devoted. Such language gives us a glimpse into the generous and Catholic spirit that Bishop Daniel Payne attributes to Wright. Although the man's statements in the chapel to Wright what do you do here were expressed many years ago. The sentiments of these words have been repeated in various ways throughout the years to subsequent students of color at Princeton Seminary. But by naming this historic library after Theodore Cedric Wright, the horrific words spoken to Wright on that day and echoed in different ways since, are not the final words and never will be. Establishing the library in honor of Wright affirms what Wright knew about his belonging here. He did belong. And it affirms what he felt about Princeton Seminary and his tenure here. He belonged then and he belongs now. May this remaining event serve as one marker of change and a shift that of that atmosphere that Wright talked about in his speech. Thanks to the tireless work of the Association of Black Seminarian members through the years, present and past, Black faculty, present and past, Black alumni, the Princeton Seminary Slavery Audit Task Force, the Board of Trustees, the administration, and so many others who worked tirelessly. Wright is receiving the recognition that he justly deserves from the institution that he cherished. Indeed, we celebrate today this honor bestowed upon this giant. Yet, we know that the struggle he engaged in continues, for the challenges of racism and anti-Black ideologies persist in the 20th century. We continue the work. As we reflect today upon this man, this giant, and as we reflect upon our own roles in the pursuit of justice and equality in our own time and place, I conclude with the encouraging, tenacious, and determined words of Wright, who said, and I quote, we have everything to hope for and nothing to fear. God is at the helm. The Bible is your platform. The Holy Spirit will aid you. We have everything necessary pledged because God is with us, end quote. Thank you. Thank you, Ruling Elder Andrea Bradford. Whew. 
And thank you, Professor Bowen, for that incredible speech that you gave with such courage to stand in front of the outgoing president of Princeton and the Racial Audit Task Force and to claim the truth about Princeton Theological Seminary and to claim God's truth and where the seminary can head and needs to go. Thanks be to God. So we thank you, Ruling Andrea Bradford, for that history moment and for talking to us about Theodore Sedgwick Wright. And we are now going to move into our piece where we now sort of say with all of that, but look at where we are now. We are here together serving God, loving one another, and we can claim the peace of Christ with one another, just as Theodore Sedgwick did so many years ago and inspires us to do as we move forward. And so the peace of Christ is in our bulletin, and we will, after we read this, after it's read and we say, and also with you, we will just get up and shake hands and say, peace and welcome and peace of Christ to you and also to you. And then we'll get back after our community life and move forward with worship. Thanks be to God. Yes, and so we introduce this wonderful time of sharing love and peace and the peace of Christ with one another. Not knowing how and yet being sure. Ah, uh, so this is the mysterious faithfulness for which we yearn. Holy One, your mercy and grace are revealed in this embrace of mystery. Mercy and grace, the seeds and soil of faith. May the love of Christ rain down and make it grow. May the peace of Christ be with all of you. And also with you. Thanks be to God. So our next um, book club meeting next Wednesday. Yes. Okay. The you first me, first Wednesday in March. What am I reading? The oh, six. The uh, six. We'll send around the scripture passages, but okay. from the from the book of Ruth. Okie dokie. <laughs> So you heard that everyone on Wednesday, there will be the women's, um, uh, the women's book club and the book you'll be looking into are some passages, passages from Ruth, which have been sent around to you. Um, uh, Brother Timothy Aveline called me up the other day and asked me if I would prepare a quiz on Ruth and Esther. Oh boy. <laughs> His church. Oh boy, he put me through the ringer with that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I gave it to him. He's like, he said, the one about Esther is hard. <laughs> All right, let us move forward. Thank you, Oscar, very much for that. And we're going to move forward with our scripture reading um, after our prayer of illumination, which we will all say together. So if you look in your bulletin, you'll see the prayer of illumination. And I'm going to ask if you're at home, you can say it out loud so that your neighbors hear it as well. And we say together, may reading your word fuel the fires of faith in our hearts. Amen. Amen. And amen. Before we read our scriptures, I just want to let everyone know that the Presbyterian women will be meeting next Sunday. Uh, immediately after the service as well. We're doing a lot of wonderful things. And so women, join us. Let us move now to our scripture readings. There are three of them. Wonderful scriptures this morning. From the book of Genesis is our first reading. The 17th chapter, verses 1 through 7, and then verses 15 and 16. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and then verses 15 and 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face. And God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram but your name shall be Abraham, 
for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. And our second reading from Romans, the fourth chapter, verses 13 through 25. Romans, the fourth chapter, Verses 13 through 25. Listen carefully for God's word for us. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or his descendants through the law, hmm. but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. Hmm. For this reason, it depends on faith hmm. in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope. He believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Mm. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. And our gospel reading from the eighth chapter of Mark, verses 31 through 38. Mark, the eighth chapter, verses 31 through 38. And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, 
if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A lot, of, a lot of words there for us to digest. So let us hold on to those. And also there's a lot of words for our young people who are out there online to digest. So let's talk to them for just a moment. When we come back, we'll talk about the faith activator. And I'll talk to you some more about that. In your bulletin, you see our moment where it says, let the children come. And you see a father and a mother with a little baby. And they are playing one of the most important games that you can ever do with a child. So guess what, young people out there? Peekaboo. 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 Now on the other end of that, if you do that to a young, 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 young baby, you will see them go like this with their face. <sighs> <sighs> Part of the reason why peekaboo is so important is because it teaches something that we grown ups cannot figure out for to save our lives. It teaches you how to have faith. Because when you go like this and you don't see your parents, you wonder where they went. And when they go like this, they show that they're always there. So when they go away and come back, no matter what happens, you remember that deep in your little heart, that somebody loves me enough that they'll always be there because they play peekaboo. And that sense of security makes you strong and makes you be able to go forward knowing that someone is always with you, maybe not next to you, but someone is always with you and wants you to know that if we can in any way, shape or form, even if we go like this, we're always gonna be back with you. Peekaboo is a faith building exercise for babies. And I don't know about you, but maybe that means that I want a peekaboo kind of faith. I want to be able to walk in the world and say, well, what in the world is God trying to do? And then God says, peekaboo, I got you. I'm going to help you with that test. I'm going to help you with that problem that you have. I'm going to help you figure out what it is you're trying to make sense of because I am here with you. And God also creates all of us around you so that when God says peekaboo, it's not just God you can see, it's all of us saying we're here for you too. So I want you to hold on to this little bit of peekaboo faith that has been instilled in your little heart from the time that you were a baby. Don't let go of it and let it grow into a mature faith that even though we may not know what our next step is, we have the faith, number one, that we don't have to go it alone. And number two, that there's always, always someone rooting for us. And number three, that the world will never, ever be able to make us be alone because we have God, 
We have everybody around us. And we have the love of our parents reminding us that even if you can't see me, I am still here. A peekaboo kind of faith. Hold on to that. And let's see if we can make sense of the rest of the scriptures for us adults as well. So we're going to sing a little song for you for special music. We didn't get a chance to practice this today. So we'll do what we do.
Thank you, Oscar. I think we made it through. <laughs> we made it through. I was once told by someone in seminary, when you sing that song, it is theologically incorrect. And I said, so what? <laughs> if God speaks to my heart through it, there is nothing incorrect about how God speaks to our hearts. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to speak to you for just a few moments today, a homily, as, as it were, on this activating faith thing that we're talking about. Some of you know that I've been reading for Lent. I just started, just ended up happening that I'm reading the book of, actually the Bible out loud, starting at the first day of Lent, actually. And I'm now into like Genesis past where we are. But we are here in Genesis 17. And it has been like lots and lots and lots of years since God first told Abram that I am going to make you the father of a multitude of nations. Actually, it's in chapter 15. And after all of that, Abraham still goes, Abram still goes to Egypt because he's a wandering Aramean. He goes to Egypt. And when he's in Egypt, he doesn't tell Pharaoh that Sarah is his wife. He says, Sarai is my sister. So Pharaoh says, well, she's beautiful. I think I want her. And then everything starts to go wrong for Pharaoh. And he says, what is wrong? And somebody says, well, that's not really his sister. That's his wife. He said, what are you trying to do to me? Take her back. Pharaoh goes so far as to say, take her back, take some gold, take some silver, take some seeds for crops, just get out of here. Whatever you need, go. And he does it again with Abimelech and fights a war. And the same thing happens. They're like, no, 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 I can't touch her because God has a plan for Abram. And Abram goes and Abram finally gets it and starts to settle down in this space underneath the oaks of memory. And God has called him out for his righteousness and his faithfulness from the very beginning. Not because he did anything. Abram didn't do a darn thing to gain God's favor. All God said was, if I make a covenant with you, <laughs> Will you follow it and be my people? I'll make you a father of many nations. I'll make you, your name go throughout all time. You will be the father of all people. I will do this for you. All you got to do is recognize me as your God. And Abram, who has been wandering and who has been going around for 50, 60, 70 years, just minding his businesses, Okay, I'm going to leave my family and do it. So he leaves his brother and he picks up and goes. And God says, I reckon this is righteousness. Because you believed in me and you said yes. You had faith in me and you said yes. This is the kind of faith that is being talked about all throughout the Bible. It starts with Abraham. So anytime you think about that word faith, go back to Abraham and just know he just said yes. He just said yes. But that's a hard thing to do year after year, in this case, chapter after chapter, realizing that God still hasn't made your barren wife bear children. And you're getting older and older and older and bending over. And, you know, you're not living like your great grandfather Noah back into the times where you were 900 years old. Now you're probably going to die somewhere around 127, 150. <laughs> and you don't have many years left at 99. But he still goes about doing what God calls him to do. Trying to figure it out. Now, there's some problematic things that happen in there that we don't have to get into with Ishmael, of course, and Hagar. But that's a whole other sermon for a whole other time. But even Ishmael is blessed because he comes from Abraham. Now, in this particular text, God reminds us through this priestly 
language that I will make my covenant with you. I call it the Cecil B. DeMille part of the Bible. <laughs> There's the one part where God talks to people and they're like, okay, so I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to make you have lots of children. You're going to be the kings. You're going to have lots of kings. It's all going to be good. And then they get to a couple of chapters later and then it's like the movie version. I will make a covenant with you and you shall multiply and have many children. This is the chapter that we're in so that it is written down for posterity's sake in a way that people know that it is formal. And he changes his name. Abraham's name, Abram, means divine ancestor is exalted. But you put in the ham, right? The Abraham. This comes from the word hamon, which means multitude. So he goes from being an exalted ancestor to the ancestors of the multitude. He changed his name so that he would recognize that his promise is secure. I will make my covenant with you. I will establish my covenant. When God establishes a covenant, it is forever. As long as you keep holding on to it, God may say, well, you stepped away from me for a while, so I'm going to step away, but I'll be back when you're ready. This covenant, this covenantal language. So that's the the background of where we are, where we get this whole idea of faith. Faith is not hoping that something is going to happen. Faith is saying, yes, I believe it will happen. How it happens, we had no idea. That's the hard human part. That's the hard part. The hard part is having faith and still trying to figure out what God is doing. The hard part is getting on the bottom of a ship and getting to South Carolina or North Carolina or Jamaica and then getting off of that boat, someone telling you that you may have heard of this Christian God and we are the Christian people, so we need you to believe this and saying, but your God is supposed to free those who are oppressed? Okay, I'm gonna have faith in that. 400 years ago, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, we heard about Cedric Wright. Emancipation was not all through America by the time this man graduated from Princeton Theological Seminary. As a matter of fact, we heard that people in New York, the First Presbyterian Church, some of their elders wanted to ship people back to Africa just to get rid of the problem rather to face up to what had been done wrong. But people still had faith. Faith enough to start this church. Faith enough to bring people from down south to say, God has a new plan for you, and we are enacting God's plan. In verse, in chapter 18, God says, I will make the people who have faith in me, true faith in me, do righteousness. Righteousness is not just a thing to which we aspire. Righteousness is something that we do. We do what is right. We do what we see needs to be fixed in this world. We do righteousness and thereby enact our faith to make it even stronger and stronger because we know that God's way is for people to be loved, for people to be healthy, for people to be happy, for people to not be oppressed. We know that God wants people to try to get back to that little forbidden place in Africa called Eden and that state of oneness with God. That is God's ultimate goal. So we do goodness and righteousness and fight oppression and fight injustice so that we can move a little bit closer to what God is going to make happen anyway. That is how we become closer to God and how our strength and faith gets deeper and deeper and gets activated is by doing righteousness. But what happens when we are so overwhelmed and overrun 
that it just seems like nothing we can do will make a difference. I don't know about you, but I have lived in the world long enough to see some injustices never seem to be righted. I have lived long enough in this world to see some measures be taken and we go one step and take two steps back. I've lived long enough to see a teenage girl who was raped by a family member being forced to bear a child and to be reminded and shamed and weakened throughout her entire life because someone didn't have the care enough for her spirit and her soul to let her and her family take care of how God was calling her body to be pure again. I've seen young people play on the playground when I grew up only to see a young boy shot because they thought that he had a toy gun on the playground while trying to play. That is two steps, three steps backwards. And it seems like where and when, oh God, will our faith be justified as righteousness? Well, there's one thing that really moved us in Bible study that helped us to understand that it's not about what we can do alone. There's one of these phrases that says that God can make righteousness out of nothing. That's what it says in Romans. You know, that God can take all of this mess and out of nothing can still create in our hearts the vision for goodness and rightness and righteousness. So we do righteousness, but we don't do it by ourselves. We do it after God says, you may feel that there is no hope, but I can make hope where there is none. I can make something out of nothing. After all, isn't that what happened in Genesis 1? Isn't that what God is all about? Making something where nothing seems to be available? Isn't that what happens when people in Israel are in slavery for 400 years and they don't seem to be able to find a way to get out? God takes something out of nothing and they even make bricks out of nothing and then God lets them all of a sudden it passes over and they go. Wasn't it, wasn't it one night in 1863 where people were sitting in a worship service praying because they heard that a law was going to pass called the Emancipation Proclamation and they prayed on their knees and waited to see if this was really going to happen and God made something out of nothing and midnight happened and freedom was now to be fought for. Didn't we see children hosed? Children bombed in churches? People beat upside the head in lunch counters? Women walking for hundreds of days to work, not taking the bus? For God to change the hearts of those who were hardened and make something out of nothing. Yes, those are all huge, huge moments in history. But please know that just as God does all these powerful things, some of us can't be involved in a lot of all that stuff that's out there. Maybe history has passed us by, but guess what? We have these little moments where we can, you know how like when you look outside in the wind and on the sidewalk, all of a sudden you see this whirlwind of the leaves going up. That's like God working 
That's how God works something out of nothing in us. All of a sudden, we, we start to feel something moving, and we are called to be something new. Our, our small movements towards righteousness for even just ourselves matter to God. We cannot be the purveyors of goodness and righteousness if we don't accept God making us better. If we don't say, I can move past my trauma because God knows me not of my trauma. God knows me for whose I am and God knew me in my mother's womb. We cannot move forward and be of help to the world when we go home and cry ourselves to sleep because we don't believe that we're worth it because of something that may have triggered us from our past. God wants it. God wants your faith to be bigger than your trauma. God wants your faith to be bigger than your mistakes. God wants your faith to be bigger than your own imagination. Because if you can dream it that big and see so much more for yourself, then how can we deny seeing so much more for our brothers and sisters and those who are gender non-conforming, all the other people in the world who deserve the same goodness that we deserve. Activating your faith by making righteousness happen with God who can make it happen out of nowhere. Andrea said on Monday, you ever stop to think about that? God making righteousness out of nothing. Now in our world, we are seeing wars and rumors of war. We are seeing genocides. We are seeing tomfoolery go on in governments, our government. And we keep wringing our hands and praying, make this happen, make that happen. I'm going to start praying, God, make some sense out of nothing. <laughs> and make me vigilant to see when the sense starts happening, when your work starts happening, when the righteousness starts actually actualizing. God, let me be aware enough with my faith to know that you're at work so that I can learn my part. Abraham had faith enough to pick up and leave. Leave his family, leave without children. He had faith enough to leave as an old man by our standards and start over. And because of that start over, became the father, Sarah became the mother of the nations. And Paul says, and this is the good thing why we focus on Abraham so much. Paul says that that promise that was made to Abraham includes us. For we too are the disciples and descendants of Abraham's spirit through God through our faith. So activated with righteousness because you have the right to. Don't let anyone tell you that you do not have the right to fight for righteousness. You have the faith, the seed of the faith of Abraham in you. So go forth. Activate it. Gracious God, this is such a hard task for us and we know it is. So we ask that you let these thoughts just sort of wave over us, oh God. 
let us not question our faith in terms of do we have enough? Let us ask, how God do you want me to use this ultimate faith that I have in you? The simplest way we can say in our testimony is that God woke me up this morning and started me on my way. God has faith in me that I can do something new because I woke up this morning. That small little nudge when we open our eyes in the morning is a promise of faith that we have the opportunity to do righteousness and goodness because our faith has been activated. And to this, oh God, we say thank you and give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our response, congregational hymn to this is, my faith looks up to thee. May thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart. My zeal inspire when life's dark maze I tread and all grief surround me spread. Be thou my God. Some people who came from France and said, is there gospel music here? Well, in our, in our advertisements, sometimes I tell people that the gospel is really the good news. So if you hear the good news of God, you know that you have heard gospel today. And even in this wonderful old ancient hymn, old hymn, older hymn, we hear, my faith looks up to thee as the good news. 
Now is that time at St. James where we lift up our prayers for the world and for one another. We do know that on the back of the bulletin, we have those who are in prayer. We are praying for Philip. Um, his grandmother called again and asked that we lift him up in prayer. Our young man who was having some housing issues here is taking a long time for things to work out, even though the plan is there. But grandma's worried, so we're gonna pray. We're gonna pray for that. We're gonna continue praying for Stephen and others. And as we move forward and Oscar continues to play, before we pray, I'm going to ask that we have one moment of silence. Because at this moment, or later on, a little bit later today, will be the celebration service for the life of Morlaine Gilmore, Cora Gilmore's sister, who passed away suddenly a few weeks ago. The funeral is today. I spoke with her pastor, and she's appreciative of our love and of our hope so we can continue to give our love to Cora in this moment of silence and asking God to bring her some comfort and peace just for one moment as Oscar plays. Sometimes the most awesome words that we can read about you, our God, are the simplest ones. I establish a covenant with you to be your God and for you to be my people. A simple statement that gives so much love to us it's not just that we love you enough to be our God but you have declared openly and from the mountaintops that you love us so much that you want to claim us as yours <laughs> It is a love like no other. It is a peace like no other. And how awesome it is. And because we are your people and you are our God, we come to you now humbly asking prayer. Asking prayer for all of the burdens of our hearts, for the joys in our lives because we're also told that when we show joy that it is pleasing to your heart we thank you for being able to have family visit us from countries thousands of miles away we thank you for mothers who would have been 114 we thank you for healing. We thank you for those who have one more day in their belt of sobriety. We thank you, O oh God, for all of the unspoken and unhidden mercies and miracles that you have shown forth in our lives. We thank you, O oh God, that with all the global warming, that it's actually cold outside because it shows that you are in charge and you are calling us to do what is right for this earth. God, we give you thanks for music that touches our hearts and our spirits and the words of those who are sitting and contemplating with a pen at their desk and come up with some of these phrases. We come to worship you. Lord, you are worthy. My faith looks up to thee, blessed assurance. For the preacher may preach, but very often we go out singing the songs of praise and of Zion 
that bring us closer to you. So we thank you for the power of creativity and art and music and the visual manifestation of the art of the cosmos with the sun pouring through these windows on a day such as this to set the atmosphere so that we know that we are in the presence of the divine and your divine is shining on each of us and throughout from inside of each of us. Gracious God, we thank you for the passage of this time for Black History Month. We are grateful that we know that the history that we teach here, no governor, no government can ever stop us from teaching history in our churches, so we're going to keep on doing it <laughs> as a model for the rest of the country. God, we thank you for our young people. We thank you for Amen and hope that he feels better. And know, oh God, that your spirit is with him and the show must go on and he did what he came to do. We ask the same for all of our young people. We ask that you would touch Shelby and all of our students who are in college right now and their parents who are finding the ways to heal and taking the time to heal while watching their children grow and flourish. So as we leave this space, but never your presence, oh God, we continue to pray in our heart of hearts that you will continue to find ways to show us joy and to show up and whip up that goodness and righteousness so that we can point to it to a broken world and say, keep hope alive for that whirlwind you see. It's God's finger whipping up a little goodness whipping up a little righteousness. And that may be all we need to strike down the biggest evils. Keep us in hope, love, peace, mercy, and grace. And as we struggle our best and do our best to do righteousness, may our faith bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And in gratitude for all that God does, we often say that our offering is a thanksgiving to God. In reading Genesis from the beginning, one of the little things I found out is that People gave to God because they knew that God was going to do for them no matter what. It wasn't just a quid pro quo. It's not the way that we look at it. It's like I give so I get something. It's not transactional. It's a celebration that what we do is we give to God so that we can do better ministry in the community, so that we can help those who are hungry, help those who are sick. And also just to say thank you, God, because this little thing that we put in the offering plate, <laughs> it is nothing compared to what you do. And we cannot pay for your grace or for your mercy or your love. So as they used to say in the Baptist church, we just give you a token of appreciation and say thanks be to God. We're going to take our offering now. You can go online to our website at www.stjamesharlemnyc.org and give on PayPal or if you're a member of PayPal you can do that www.stjamesharlemnyc.org we encourage you and if you're online and on Facebook remember www.stjamesharlemnyc.org give a little bit of extra for Black History Month just do what you can and we give thanks to God for you
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We give you thanks for all of these gifts that are coming in and that will continue to come in. But we ask, oh God, humbly, that you give us the wisdom to be good stewards of the gifts that have been given to you so that we may be the purveyors of goodness and righteousness of our faith in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 All right, I'm going to take a sip, clear my throat a little bit, because it is time for the final hymn. And our final hymn, we do every Sunday in Black History Month, lift every voice and sing. So we're going to ask if you're able physically to stand as we sing this song that many are upset about being sung, and righteously so, because this is a song of hope that calls us above our divisions. And some folk don't like to be reminded that that's what we're called to do. And so we will lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies Of liberty Let our rejoicing rise
and sing with that hope of our faith. Let us go from this place with our faith activated and let us do our best to do righteousness and goodness in the world. Even if it seems like it's not making a difference, know that it will touch somebody's heart and maybe somebody will turn on their path for goodness and righteousness just because they see the smile on your face. So go from this place with that peace and that love.